Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming back for the uh, third lecture of the week. Um, the theme of this week is neutrons. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about current research in time correlated neutron techniques. Uh, this is somewhere, uh, as for the people who are here every day, you might have noticed that we're getting more and more in depth and on the next few weeks, that, that certainly is the case. Um, today is starting to be a transition into that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about details, uh, but still connected to uh, high level results and implications. Um, as always, feel free to type questions in chat. I do have it open. Uh, might wait till the end to address them. Uh, yeah. There we go. Um, so yeah, in this talk, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some recent results, which will also show what research is currently ongoing. Um, you heard Dr. Alexis Trahan earlier this week talk about Rossi Alpha and neutron multiplicity counting. And we are gonna be talking about those today. Um, because we've heard a lot of talks about neutrons lately and general theme of the motivation of non-destructive assay, the introduction of motivation will be abbreviated and we're just gonna dive in it. Uh, and I'll also disclaim this is not a comprehensive review of current research uh, within the consortium for monitoring, tech, monitoring technology and verification. Uh, there are plenty of people uh, working on results. I can definitely touch on some of those. Uh, and then also in the broader community and internationally as well. Uh, so I'll be talking about some of the stuff I've worked on and some of the stuff that's really transitioning. Sound isn't good. Okay. We'll plug in. Thanks for letting me know. Let me try microphone. All right. Hopefully this is a little bit better. You can let me know if not. Okay. I'm not seeing anything, so I'm going to go ahead and keep going. But uh, if other people are having issues, just let me know. Uh, yeah, so we're going to we're going to start with uh, Rossi Alpha analysis, and this is uh, probably probably the I would say. The, my area of expertise. Uh, and we're going to talk about so kind of what it's been traditionally and then uh, more recent results where we kind of expand traditional models to account for reflectors. And we're also going to talk about uncertainty methods. Uh, the uncertainty methods are in the weeds, full disclaimer, uh, but they are very transferable. It's not just a Rossi Alpha method. So I'm going to be describing um, the best way to call it is a voodoo quasi analytic method, uh, emphasis on the voodoo. Uh, but it, it can be applied to any data set where you're fitting something and you're having a hard time estimating uncertainty. Uh, you know, con consider this method and definitely reach out to me and we can, we can work on it together. I'm going to talk about organic scintillators versus helium-3 detectors, uh, which has also been a theme of this summer school because that's a theme of Professor Sarah Pozzi's group. Uh, but they really do give us a bunch of additional capabilities. So I will talk about those additional capabilities, uh, which include um, some specific examples and also just the fact that organics are faster. They give you spatial information so you can look at N isotropy or the non-uniform distribution of signatures in space and energy. Now, the relationship between Rossi alpha and neutron multiplicity counting is they're both neutron noise techniques. We're looking at correlated neutrons in time. Uh, when K effective or the multiplication of criticality is low, we're going to use neutron multiplicity counting because we're looking at isolated events, isolated bursts of neutrons. Uh, and then as k effective gets closer to one, so near or delayed critical, uh, when they're overlapping fission chains, it's much harder to do neutron multiplicity counting because multiplicity will overlap in time. It's much harder to distinguish them. Uh, so instead, what we do is uh, Rossi alpha analysis. Uh, so we're just going to dive into the Rossi alpha method. A, a big reason that we do the Rossi alpha method is to estimate K effective. Uh, K effective is an extremely important parameter in uh, nuclear engineering. Uh, it has implications in safeguards and non-proliferation, of course, but also in criticality safety, making sure we're not accidentally going super critical, and also an emergency response. Do we have nuclear material, multiplying material, or nuclear weapons, or is this maybe just a RDD, a radiological dispersion device? Um, still something to be concerned about, but not as much as a nuclear weapon. 
Uh, a challenge though is we can't directly measure K effective. We don't have a uh, K effective meter where we can just turn it on and say, yep, that's K effective. Um, so what we do is we infer it from the prompt neutron, the K constant, or it's inverse the prompt period. Um, and the relationship between K effective and alpha is in this equation uh, where you plug in alpha and you calculate K effective. And there are two other variables here, beta effective, which is the effective delayed neutron fraction and lambda, the mean neutron generation time. Now, the reason that we say we infer K effective and not that we measure K effective is that we're not measuring beta effective and we're not measuring lambda. So we either have to grab those values from reference, um, more commonly we have to simulate it, or we have to perform multiple measurements where we can tease those parameters out. Um, yeah, and then uh, just a GIF playing in the uh, upper right of uh, multiplying system. This was made by John Rodriguez, so uh, the person that you get emails from, he's an excellent animator and artist. So uh, in our Rossi Alpha measurement, what we do is we take our detector, so the detectors that we do have detect neutrons, and what we do is we look at the time of neutron detections. We then calculate the time difference between any and all neutron detections, so we call these little arrows of time differences, and we then histogram the time differences. And what we see is the plot that Alexis was showing you. This is from real measured data. And what we see is a decaying exponential to a constant. This constant region represents the uniform probability of finding for random neutrons, randomly correlated, um, so uncorrelated. So this could be neutrons from different chains. It could be um, a cosmic neutron and a neutron from your material. It could be an accidental neutron. Uh, but the point is, if it's accidental, then there's an equal chance in any time of you detecting it. And that's why this area is flat. Then there's exponential decay. Uh, and this describes your correlated neutrons or your prompt neutrons in the system. Your, and these, so in general, if anything has a lifetime um, as these do, they, they tend to decay uh, exponentially. And we can imagine this where, where this exponential dies off, we could say that this is about the length of fission chains. Um, so we're seeing correlated neutrons, they slowly decay as the fission chain dies out and then you know, form. And so this is a single exponential where alpha is a negative number plus a constant. Uh, so once we fit this curve, because alpha is a fit parameter, we've, we finished the Rossi alpha measurement. We have alpha and then we can go ahead and infer K effective. Now, something that's um, been discovered, I'd say recently, probably starting in 2006 and really confirmed in 2017, uh, at least experimentally with high quality data, is that a one exponential fit is not good for, the, for these data. Uh, so it's the same plot shown on, uh, one is on log scale, one is on linear scale. Blue is the two exponential fit and red is the one exponential fit. And the two exponential fit is a better fit to the data. So we can kind of see two linear portions on a log plot and lines on the log plot correspond to exponentials. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then the one exponential is averaging these two, uh, kind of as we would expect. So if we use a one exponential, we're not capturing all of the physics that are going on. Uh, but with the two exponential, that's, that's a great fit. Uh, besides looking at this with our eyes, we can look at what uh, prior work did. Uh, so lots of plots here. I'm going to walk through it. And just uh, pay attention to the ones that are highlighted. On the left is one exponential and on the right is two exponential. And for the plots that we're showing, these residual plots, we expect them to vertically be uniformly distributed about y equals zero. So it should look the same. And in the one exponential, it's, it does not look the same to structure, which means that the fit is missing structure. Whereas if you look at the two exponential, it's pretty uniform up and down. Uh, it's not uniform left to right, but up and down, it is uniform. If we look at the plots in the upper right, um, this is another residual plot. They should be bell curve uh, distributed, so um, Gaussian distributed. And the one exponential is not, it has a very long tail. Um, probably could have plotted this on the log. Uh, but the two exponential, this is great. And then lastly, in the lower right, uh, these plots should be linear, again, one exponential is not, two exponential is. Uh, so this is a statistic, statistical approach to show 
the two exponential method is better. The problem is, so we know two exponential is better, but for quite a while we didn't know how to how to get alpha out of the two exponential. And it was thought that one of the exponentials represented alpha and the other one represented slowing down time or the amount of time that a neutron spends in the reflector before detection. Because that's where this two exponential comes from. Uh, before it was, if you had just a chunk of metal uh, and neutrons were decaying, you were fine. But as soon as you added the reflector, you added new time correlations because now neutrons can bounce and take longer to get to the detector or they can bounce and go back into the material and start a new fission chain or sustain fission chain. Uh, so it, it was an open question, how, how does one get alpha from the two exponentials? So uh, in 2018, we, we started, looking at, um, started looking at data to, to develop the theory. Uh, so originally the Rossi alpha method was developed for a single region, so just a core. Uh, with some lifetime, some lifetime in the core. And with one region, we got one exponential. And this is the same, same function that I showed a couple slides ago. What we then did was say, you know what, why don't we consider two regions? So where neutrons can go into or leave the core, but also come back in. And so we call the core and the reflector, the core and not the core over here. So exterior is the reflector. And maybe there's a detector out here. And by accounting for two regions, we got two exponentials. Uh, these equations, so it's not super important what they are. Uh, what I do want to point out is that we still have that constant region, but the exponential region has two exponentials, so R1 and R2. And it's not the case that alpha is one of them. It's that alpha is a linear combination of the two. So big R is a number between 0 and 1. Uh, so alpha is going to be a combination of the two exponentials. So we can't just say, you know what, this exponential is alpha, this one is slowing down time. Uh, these, the two parameters, so LCTP is the slowing down time. Uh, though <clears throat> they're, they're a combination. And so this theory is really important because it hadn't been done before and it helps us uh, tease out these parameters. What we're currently doing um, and have done to an extent is validate this model. And we validate it with two ways. The first is we measure uh, the prompt period, so one over alpha, and we simulate and we compare. Now, normally in our field, we take simulations at, or rather we take measurements as the ground truth or the reference value. And we compare simulation to measurement and say, look, the simulation is right. In this case, extensive work. I mean, since, since Manhattan Project times, simulations have been validated for measurements very near critical uh, for clear reasons. Uh, so we're, we're going to take a leap of faith and trust the simulation. And if we do that and compare the two, there's excellent agreement. So up arrows in blue are measured, down arrows in yellow are simulated. And by comparing these values, we are getting exactly the correct alpha. Tying it back to application where we really want multiplication or K effective, we simulate K-effective and we have high fidelity simulations for K-effective. And then uh, we measure, so it's in quotes because we measured alpha and then, or sorry, measured alpha and then simulated beta effective in lambda in a separate simulation. And by putting these in, we were able to estimate the blue. So blue is measured, red is simulated. Um, the red has a very nice trend. I should have backed up and said uh, what we measured was the burp ball, so five and a half kilograms of weapons grade plutonium reflected by three inches of iron, nickel, copper, and tungsten, or bare. So we have a nice range of K-effective values from 0.77 to just under 0.95. It's like 0.94 plus or minus. And what we see is that the agreement improves as we get closer to K-effective. So we're, we are getting the right alpha because we agree the whole way. Uh, but now what we're seeing is uh, because the theory is designed for a critical system, or designed for a system where k effective is equal to one, as we get a little bit further away from unity, our assumptions break down and our uh, accuracy is not as good. So maybe in this region, we should be using neutron multiplicity count. Um, and I say maybe it's uh, Jordy McKenzie's, McKenzie's uh, thesis said about 0.8 is when you want to switch over to multiplicity count or Feynman analysis. 
Uh, so that's what I'll say for validation for now. Uh, definitely, if we have questions, we can go further in. But I'm going to transition to talking about uncertainty, uncertainty quantification. And to be blunt, um, current, current uncertainty estimation techniques are long and wrong. And I am showing you both screenshots of uh, file folders to, to demonstrate this. What we do is we take a very long measurement. And I mean, um, days worth of measurements or at least hours or overnight measurement. And in this case, we took a 75 minute measurement, uh, which is long for, um, if, if you're booking time at a very nice facility with, um, with this kind of material, um, 75 minutes is a really long time to be measuring. So then what you would do is split the 75 minutes into 75 one minute files. So you've taken one long measurement and split it down. And what you would do is for each of these files, so these files represent lists of neutron detection times, you calculate histograms for each of them. So now you have 75 histograms. And then you calculate alpha for each of them and take the mean and take the standard deviation. You say the standard deviation is your error. So why is it long? Well, you have to take a long measurement to have enough data to split it up. And why is it wrong? Well, <clears throat> it, it's not completely wrong, but what you're doing is you're, you are inaccurately folding in fit uncertainty with, uh, with uh, histogram uncertainty. So what I mean by that is in each of your histograms, so when you have counts per uh, different time divisions, you have vertical error. You, there are vertical error bars, uh, but you don't have them available to you. Uh, so if you just take the standard deviation, then really all you're doing is uh, calculating your fit uncertainty. And you're not accounting for the uncertainty that the data have themselves. Uh, so th the question really is, how do you get uh, error bars? And, it, and it's not intuitive. We can't, uh, if you're familiar with Poisson st statistics, uh, this is very specifically not a Poisson system. So we can't just take the square root of the counts and call it good. Uh, so, so what uncertainty, what the uncertainty process would look like is we have to estimate the error bars. Once we have the error bars, we can propagate error bars to the fit parameter. So uh, we do that by weighting a fit. Uh, so by feeding it into the fitting algorithm, we are now correctly accounting for the histogram uncertainty. Um, and then once we have the uncertainty in the fit parameters, we can propagate that to alpha. But the big question is how do we get it? How do we get the error bars? Uh, so there's the sample variance method, which is very similar to what I just described. So instead of calculating alpha for each of the files, we can, between the files, take a, a standard deviation for each bin and then take a mean. Um, and, and that's fine, but so in that case, the method is correct. It's no longer wrong, but it's still long. Uh, so we looked at a quasi-analytic method, and this is the part that can be broadly applied. Um, and remember that this is voodoo. It's, um, if you're a mathematician, you should be mad because uh, it, it, this does not follow math laws. If you're a statistician, you should be overjoyed because it doesn't follow math laws and you're using statistics uh, to get an engineering answer. So what we do, so when we have our distribution and we fit it, what we have is a probability density function. And when you have a probability density function, you can calculate means and variances uh, based on the function by taking intervals. So what we can do is say, let's say this is my histogram, red curve is my histogram, and these dashed lines represent sample bins. What we have inherently in the system is horizontal error bars or horizontal uncertainty. We're unsure about the time of neutron detection, and so we're unsure about the time difference. Uh, so it's clear how to propagate uncertainty horizontally but then how do you turn it to vertical error bars? Well, we can, for each bin, we assume that there's a Gaussian spread. So maybe, maybe I put a count in this bin, but it really belongs over here. So by using our probability density function, we calculate a mean and standard and a variance, and that defines this Gaussian uh, with the center mean and a spread by the variance. 
what we can then say is what is the probability that a count in this J bin really belongs in the I bin? And what we do is we integrate. So if we integrate between the bounds of the I bin, so that's this maze portion, and divide it by the total area, which is blue, uh, is blue. <clears throat> then we get the probability of that account in J belongs in I. And after that, we can apply binomial theorem to say, um, to calculate the variance in I due to J and do this for every single bit. If you're interested, uh, extensive details are uh, in this publication. It just got published. Uh, so you can either Google uh, certainty Rossi alpha and it'll be the first one, uh, or these slides will be uploaded. Click the link. Um, and then the other method that I'm going to show on the next slide, I'm not talking about it here, uh, but we could talk about it, is bootstrapping, uh, which lives somewhere in between the analytic method and the sample method. So the first thing that we wanted to do, so here are, here's our time difference and we're looking at relative uncertainty. So we wanted to show uh, that we're correctly estimating the error bars. So yellow squares are analytic. Uh, Red diamonds are the bootstrap method, and then our reference is the sample method because it is completely legitimate. The only drawback right now is that it's long. And what we see is there's excellent agreement. Our, our voodoo method, uh, if anything, is conservative. It's going to overestimate the uncertainty. Uh, so a slight drawback of the bootstrap method is it underestimates. Uh, but there's excellent agreement here uh, in trend and magnitude. And then if we put this through the fitting algorithm uh, and have it pop out uh, uncertainty in the prompt period, so this is alpha plus or minus, uh, we see that there's agreement. So again, blue is the sample method, uh, yellow and red are uh, our two new methods, and they agree with an error bars. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, we have validation. Now, in, in general, que questions might be, why, why do we care to have rigorous uncertainty? And there are two reasons. The standard answer is a measurement without uncertainty isn't a measurement because you don't know how much to trust it. And if we're looking, um, and also if we're looking to do criticality safety, then uh, we really need to know uh, if I have a K effective of 0.8 plus or minus three, well, I either have an impossible system or a very super critical system. Uh, so, so uncertainty is important. The other thing is we can use uncertainty and this is, um, one of my summer students has been working on this, is we can use the uncertainty to inform best practices. So how should we, um, in, in our Rossi Alpha history, and what should our bin width be? And we can do this by looking at the relative uncertainty and saying, uh, because now we have a way to estimate it, and, and we can see a trend that, well, the lowest possible bin width is possible, lowest being uh, whatever your electronics allow. And we can look at the cutoff. And by cutoff, I mean the reset time. So how, how long of a tail do you want? Um, <clears throat> and oh, again, what we, what we see is a trend. So the blue is relative uncertainty. Red is relative error. And if we take the second derivative to look at what this inflection point is, uh, the peak of that derivative lines up with the minimum relative error. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, and, and there's a lot going on here. Uh, but this is all to say that uncertainty quantification is actually helpful in a practical sense uh, because it helps improve accuracy. I'm going to check messages real quick before we get in. All right, Jake, I'm, I'm sorry about the volume. Um, it sounds like it's clear to other people, so I'm hoping that it'll be fine in the recording. If it's not fine in the recording, then um, it's easy enough for me to do this presentation again with uh, nice over the ear headphones and I'll upload the clear recording. Uh, so if it's not working right now, sorry that you can't hear it live, uh, but I will get a viewable version up to the Google Drive. All right, uh, so uh, uh, we're, we're gonna start to transition and talk about the comparison between organic simulators and helium-3. Um, and then I'm gonna show one more Rossi Alpha result and I promise I'll be done with that in the transition. Uh, so organic simulators, uh, again, this is a point belabored by, um, by many of the speakers uh, this summer. For organic simulators, the detection system mechanism is a uh, scatter, and it's typically elastic scatter on hydrogen. Whereas in helium-3, the detection mechanism is thermal neutron capture. 
And so you need moderation to increase the efficiency. By moderation, I typically mean polyethylene. And we can see in this photo, here are the helium-3 tubes, and we put them inside polyethylene. And it's great for improving efficiency, but if we look at organic simulators, if our efficiency is good enough, we push our detectors in really close. Well, if we don't have moderation, then neutrons aren't spending time thermalizing, losing energy, and, uh, and bouncing around the reflector. So we, we detect neutrons faster. We're looking at nanosecond scale or picosecond scale, as opposed to microsecond or millisecond scale. Also, because the neutrons aren't losing energy uh, in the reflector, we are sensitive to a portion of the initial energy by the, uh, that the neutrons have. And then lastly, um, we're, we're sensitive to spatial information. So because neutrons aren't changing their direction by scattering in the detector, um, if I have neutrons uh, emitted at some angle alpha, then I, then I know that there's a correlation there. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna touch on each of these briefly. Uh, each of the, what does energy and what the spatial bias. Uh, the main focus though is gonna be time because that, that's where current research is. And if you're looking to expand your research horizons and you've been convinced this summer to look at organic simulators, uh, then I s extremely encourage you to look at energy and spatial. What do those parameters buy you? Uh, because these really haven't been looked at and, and that's really what the current research is now. But if you have a nice pattern, just remember me. Uh, so one thing that I'll say, uh, so going to, I have two more Rossi Alpha slides. Uh, this one's quick. What I'm showing is in blue on the left axis are helium-3 uh, helium results. And then I've already shown you, on, so the red axis on the right is the reference values, the simulated true values uh, that I already showed that the organic simulators could measure. But the helium-3, note that this is microseconds. And note that the um, alphas are nanoseconds. So because the neutrons are slowing down in the moderator, that's all that the helium-3 can see. If something takes microseconds to happen, excuse me, you're, you're not going to see something that happens on a nanosecond scale. And so helium-3 detectors are in, insensitive to prompt periods of fast metal assembly. So if I have a chunk of metal reflected by metal, then helium-3 can't measure it. Uh, so you can't trust helium-3 for stockpile stewardship. You can't trust it for uh, sodium-cooled fast reactors. You can't, you can't trust it in these applications. And uh, for that matter, you, you can't really trust it in general. Uh, one might think that in a thermal application where the prompt period, you would think that it would be longer because uh, the neutrons are slower. But what we saw, so we took a measurement of highly enriched uranium, a uh, bare reflected by one and a half inches and two and a half inches of high density polyethylene, with K effectives ranging from 0.8 to 0.95. And what we saw when we added uh, the polyethylene is yes, um, the, the neutrons got moderated, they were lower energy, but so these heat maps are, so this is per area, this is per volume. We see that the location of induced fission migrates from somewhere in the middle, and these are hollow shells, hence the, hence the void in the middle. They start to bleed towards the edge and then at, at the end they're, they're isolated on the edge. And what we see is that we go from core lifetimes of several nanoseconds to sub nanosecond and then less than that. And so a thermal system doesn't mean a slower alpha, or sorry, a slower prompt period, it means a faster prompt period. Um, and so really helium-3 systems can't be used for this. And it, it's great that we have organic simulators. The only time that you might be able to use a helium-3 system is very, very, very close to critical. So a K effective of 0.99999, um, probably five nines. And uh, even then, now you start to run into issues with count rate on helium-3 because they're more efficient, can't handle that. Um, so this is my vendetta against helium-3. Uh, but as promised, uh, I'm going to transition away from Rossi Alpha. What we're going to talk about next is neutron multiplicity counting um, and an isotope that I focused on for a little bit is Neptunium-237. Uh, so if you've seen the MTV workshops, um, this is going to be a repeat. 
Uh, but I think it's I think it's full results. Uh, so Neptunium-237 is a proliferation concern. Uh, and I think a lot of people have heard of uranium and, I've, and have heard of plutonium, but maybe not Neptunium. Uh, and the reason is Neptunium was actually, the fact that it could be used for a weapon was classified initially because there was no way to detect it. And uh, spoiler alert for the motivation, there still isn't a way to detect it. Uh, the, the, the US Department of Energy classifies it as other nuclear material um, and is reportable in gram quantities. So you have a gram of Neptunium-237, um, the IAEA and the uh, NRC are going to want to know about it. The international community knows that Neptunium-237 could be used for a weapon. Uh, the qualities that normally make an isotope not nice for a weapon, such as self-protecting uh, dose rate or heat generation or spontaneous fusion, do not exist in Neptunium-237. Uh, 3,000 kilograms are annually produced, but it only takes 40 to 60 kilograms to make a weapon. Um, and, and there might be per commercial application for development of Neptunium 237, especially with the recent SpaceX launch, uh, because RTGs, so space generators, use plutonium 238. You make plutonium 238 by bombarding Neptunium 237. Uh, so this, this is an isotope that's around. Um, it can be used for a weapon. So we want to be able to perform non-destructive assay. We want to be able to measure it, but we don't have that capability. Uh, so we'd like to develop one. Um, I'll touch briefly. Uh, so uh, again, Alexis mentioned neutron multiplicity counting, um, where we look at correlated neutrons from fission. And by measuring the multiplicity distribution, we can determine the mass of the sample. So more doubles or more triples means more material. Uh, that's all I'll say for now. Uh, another review. So again, it's very similar to Rossi Alpha. We're looking at neutron detection times. And in fact, I'm pretty sure this is the same line that I used from the beginning. And we look at chunks. We call these gates. And we look at the neutrons within a gate. So if we have a gate with three neutrons in it, um, several things could happen here. This could be three singles. So maybe I had a nucleus fission and it was um, one neutron, one neutron, and one neutron. It could have been, there are three ways that you could have a double. Uh, so the first two could be a double, the last two could be a double, first and third could be a double. And there's only way to have a triple. So it's the question of which, which one of these is it? Uh, and the answer is we don't know, so we count for all of them. But um, main takeaway from this slide is that we look in little gates of time. For organic scintillators, these gates of times are on the scale of hundreds of nanoseconds. So in my analysis, I've used 100 nanoseconds. For helium-3 systems, they're one millisecond, uh, so 1,000 microseconds. Um, I, I am going to speed up here. We, we performed simulation and looked at organic scintillator measuring neptunium-237 and helium-3 measuring neptunium-237. And we compared the doubles and triples multiplicity count rates. So organic scintillators are shown on the left, helium-3 is shown on the right, doubles are shown on top, triples on the bottom. And for the doubles, th there's actually pretty good separation from both systems for large samples. Uh, but if we zoom in, uh, the helium-3 system still has some overlap in these error bars, so we can't distinguish small masses. Um, and we did, so the masses that we're looking at are 10 grams all the way up to one kilogram logarithmically spaced. Uh, but the organic simulators can. So we would need, in a 20 minute measurement, they can. So we would need four and a half times more the measurement time for helium-3 systems to be able to distinguish this. Uh, it's way worse in the case of triples. A 20 minute measurement is just enough for the organic simulator system to distinguish all these masses. But if this is abysmal for a helium-3 system. I couldn't tell you the difference between one kilogram of Neptunium uh, 237 and 10 grams. Uh, so clearly in, in simulation world, it, there's no way that you can go to a facility with a helium-3 detector and measure this or have, have detectors at a border crossing and try to measure for Neptunium 237 unless maybe you were using gammas. Uh, so, uh, so organic simulators win in, in simulation. So what we did was we looked at measurement. Um, Lots of measurement details I'm going to breeze through. Uh, we measured a six kilogram sphere, 
with an organic simulator system. So this is my organic simulator made prototype uh, called Oscar. And then the Nomad, which is a helium-3 based system. We just put the detectors around the sample. And what we saw is, <clears throat> so what we've plotted here is relative uncertainty. And on top is the helium-3 curve. And on the bottom is the organic simulator curve. It's a function of time. And the organic simulators are 632 times faster than the helium-3 system. So we're talking about to get a 1% relative uncertainty. Organic simulators can do that in less than five minutes. And, th and that's 1% relative uncertainty. That's pretty good. Helium-3 systems were required two days um, to achieve 10% relative uncertainty, so relaxed in a bit. Uh, we need less than three seconds for organics, but 30 minutes for helium-3. And, and this reduction of time, not only is it faster, so normally what I say is, hey, the system is faster, it's gonna save you procedural and operational costs. It, there are two things here. One is you can actually do a comprehensive test. So a lot of the time, if, if I am a inspector and I can't measure all of your material, then I'm going to randomly select a subset and hope that it's a, a representative. Uh, and this is also the, the case for forehead verification. And the other is that three seconds is fast, and this, um, and I'm really jumping ahead to conclusions, but this allows for dynamic measurements. So what if I have material moving through a pipe? Well, depending on the mass flow rate, and, and remember, this is a, a system, I'm sorry, the Oscar system is not optimized for pipes yet. I could have this wrap around the pipe and use a couple more detectors. I could, I can measure moving material, and this is something that's never been, been really considered a possibility before. Um, and we're actively planning a measurement of Savannah River National Laboratory right now. Um, so this is definitely also in the future of current research. Um, it, I, this is on the brink of current to future. Um, I, I, I did speed past this. The, the 632 times faster, it's true that helium-3 is more efficient than organic simulators. And in this measurement, they were 13.7 times more efficient. But the organic simulators, again, because it's 100 nanoseconds versus one millisecond, if we're dividing up, up this, the same measurement time by smaller boxes, the organic simulators are going to have more boxes. Uh, so 10 to, form, 10 to the four more gates, but helium-3 has 10 more neutrons for each neutron that the organic simulator sees. That gets you a, a factor between 100 and 1,000. And, that, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, so that finishes it for neutron multiplicity counting. Um, so what I've really harped on so far is organic simulators are superior in time. I'm now going to talk, uh, touch on spatial and energy uh, sensitivities and then wrap it up. Uh, so one slide on each. For spatial sensitivity, uh, when neutrons are emitted in fission, they're not emitted isotropically. So if I have a nucleus and it splits the moment, there's a lot going on, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and just uh, there's a, a lot of forces that we still don't understand uh, in, in two or three weeks. Uh, it, it's a fission week where the, those are big questions. But as we move away, the neutrons that are emitted are either going to be um, emitted along this line or this line. So the same line, uh, different directions. And that's what we see. So we're, as a function of angle, what we see is as we get closer to zero, we see more neutrons. And as we get closer to 180, we see more neutrons. So these are, we just see two neutrons in a short window. And at 90 degrees, so that would be like in the splitting and then one neutron going this way, a neutron that's kind of moving this way, deciding to go that way. Uh, it, it's uncommon. So what we can do is look at this ratio as a function of multiplication and see that as a system becomes more and more multiplying, this ratio goes down and down and down. Now, what this means is we have another method to estimate multiplication, leakage multiplication in this case. And so, again, this is, this is a measurement that was never possible because neutrons would scatter around in helium-3. So it's a new sensitivity leading to new capabilities. Uh, so we can, we can utilize spatial. Um, in the energy realm, we can, so a challenge in a saying fresh fuel. So I have fuel, it's about to go in the reactor, but I want to make sure a country didn't take some of that fuel and divert it to a clandestine application. Well, before it was easy, we just measured the fuel. 
Now, because we use higher enriched fuel because it's economically favorable, uh, designers have put burnable poisons in the fuel. So burnable poisons are isotopes that absorb neutrons and it helps the fuel uh, maintain a uniform behavior for a longer amount of time. But what that means is if I'm trying to detect how much material there is, I'm competing now with poisons that are in the reactor. So if I measure the same reactor, one with burnable poisons and one without, it's gonna say that the, that the reactor with burnable poisons is missing material. And if I'm, if I'm trusting the operator to tell me what the burnable poison content is, the operator could just lie to me and, and, and I would never know. Um, so we wanted to find another method. And what we looked at, so uh, we were, a, a lot goes into this plot, but using correlated neutrons and then changing our detection threshold, we saw that our defect, so our error in the estimate due to burnable poisons, decreased as we looked at higher and higher thresholds. So when we're looking at high energy neutrons that are less likely to be captured in the burnable poisons. So again, new sensitivity, new capability. Uh, and this brings us to conclusions. I will say that, um, oh, sorry, I thought I had a summary slide earlier, but <clears throat> so we have timing, we have energy, and we have spatial, and these are the new things with organic scintillators. All of these also help us perform imaging. Uh, it creates a neutron scatter camera. Um, and so that's going to be the topic of another week. So uh, the weeks coming forth is a week that I don't remember, a fission week and an imaging week. Uh, and the imaging week utilizes all of these advantages of organic simulators to create a neutron scatter camera. Uh, but I won't spoil any surprises. Um, so that brings me to conclusions. And again, this is not a comprehensive list of what's going on. Uh, there's a lot going on because it's a really important field uh, with international implications and it's also fun to work on, uh, which is why there's a good deal, uh, there are a good deal of people in the consortium working on it. Uh, the conclusions are all the way back in the Rossi Alpha is that the two region point kinetics model um, is better, it's more accurate and you need it. And the theory is needed to figure out how to pull out alpha and we validated that. Going to just a more general sense theme of this talk, organic simulators are a lot better than helium-3. Helium-3 um, has the advantage of efficiency. Uh, they don't have a phenomenon called neutron crosstalk, uh, but otherwise or organic simulators, just these additional capabilities are uh, really pull through for them. Uh, with, with that improved timing uh, and neutron multiplicity counting, you can expand our field of view from, I go into a facility with my system and wait for people to put stuff in the system and I measure it to dynamic assays. I can, uh, at three seconds, I can drive the system around in a truck. I can put it around a pipe. I can see material moving and tell you how much is moving. Um, uh, so that's really cool. Uh, and then a uh, general theme of what's current and what's future, new sensitivities and features are result in new signatures and capabilities. There's no such thing as a negative feature of a material. Um, it's just a feature that you haven't figured out how to exploit yet. So um, that is my presentation. Um, thanks for sticking around and I will take any questions. I know I ran long, so if you have to head out, uh, feel free to email me questions. It's in the bottom, but I'll uh, hang around for a few minutes uh, for any questions in chat. With the fission neutron directionality issue, wouldn't you need to know the energy and direction of the neutrinos as well? 
Uh, James, do you mean neutrinos or um, neutrons? Neutrinos, okay. Uh, no, you, you don't really. Uh, really what, what we're looking at with the directionality is uh, this is as a function of multiplication. As, <clears throat> as you have a system that is more multiplying, the neutrons will start to be more and more isotropic if you're looking at short time windows. Um, so that's really all that we're looking at. Uh, we're not backing into energy and neutrinos to figure out um, multiplication exactly. We're just looking at the distortion of that angular distribution due to multiplication. Uh, slide eight, what is an LMX file? LMX is, it's just a proprietary file for list mode data. Um, I think it was like list mode Excel data. Uh, so no, not for K code. It's what the uh, nomad system I showed um, outputs data as. Um, it's just binary language for detection time and which detector or which two of the inside of it uh, saw that neutron. Uh, but you could just think of it as a list of times and it would be the same. Um, are there situations where helium-3 detectors work better than organic simulators? Um, yes and no. Still an area where we're looking at it. An issue that we do see with organic simulators is neutron crosstalk, where, uh, you know, I really thought I had a slide on this. Let me slides. So I did lose a lot of slides earlier because my cat stepped on the delete button. I'm a first time cat owner learning. Um, so I, I have lost that slide, but what, uh, what can happen is, I'm gonna use these equation numbers as my detector. So think of 8.2 as a detector and 8.3 as a detector. And helium three, if a neutron goes in and gets detected, it's captured, it's done, it's out of the system. In organic simulators, uh, because it's scatter, I could scatter in here, but the neutron's still around. So if I render a detection in 8.2, then I still can scatter into 8.3 and be detected. And now I have one neutron masquer masquerading around this multiple. Uh, and if I'm using a calibration curve to say more doubles equals more material, if I'm accidentally having fake doubles due to this phenomenon called crosstalk, uh, then I'm gonna be wrong. So in situations where maybe if I have very small samples uh, where I I need very good efficiency and need virtually no crosstalk because I don't want any accidental um, coincidences, then in that case, I'd probably use helium-3. Um, so that, that's a good question. Uh, is helium-3 more efficient even with lower density gas than organic simulators with um, higher density? Yes, um, so organic simulator, or sorry, helium-3, in the, in the detection system here, they are pressurized to 10 atmospheres, 10 ATM. Uh, and the density of these crystals is, it's either 0.98 or 1.1. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, it, even with those density levels where the, the gas is probably, it's either 0.125 or 0.025. Uh, so the organics are 10 to 100 times more dense. Helium-3 still has a higher detection efficiency because the cross-section for capture is in the thousands to tens of thousands of volumes, whereas for scatter, um, well, it depends on the energy, but we're talking no more than hundreds of volumes. Uh, slide 25 is the case three, sorry, 25. Um, could you clarify what your question is, Daniel? Can you do a slide 15? Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what your question is, um, so I'll, I'll get back to you if you can email me or clarify in the chat.
All right, it looks like the chat has slowed down, so I'm going to stop the recording, uh, but I'll stay on until four in case there are any lingering questions. Thanks, everyone.